just you fasted 40 days and 40 nights with perfect discipline. Give to us grace that we may have self-control towards righteousness and holiness through your might and merits. Amen. We're in chapter 4 of Dr. Millard Erickson's Christian Theology, uh, page 81. Theology and critical study of the Bible. Form criticism, redaction criticism, and guidelines for evaluating critical methods of many factors which have marked the transition from the pre-modern to modern period in theology. Perhaps the most significant has been the adoption of critical methodology in the study of the Bible. For long periods of time, the exegete was thought as merely explicating the plain sense of the scripture. The various books of the Bible were assumed to be written by persons to whom they were traditionally attributed. And the dates usually ascribed to them, most Christians believe that the Bible described events as they'd actually occurred. It was thought that a chronology of the Bible could be developed, and indeed this was done by Archbishop James. Usher, who dated creation from 4000 BC. Harmonies of the Gospels were formulated to give a picture of the biography of Jesus. Gradually, the approach to the Bibles changed, however. Number one, we have general introductions to the various types of criticism. Student readers referred to the Guides of Biblical Scholarship series published by Fortress Press, Norman Habel, Literary Criticism of the Old Testament, Gene Tucker, Form Criticism of the Old Testament, William Rast's Tradition History in the Old Testament, Ralph Klein, Textual Criticism of the Old Testament, Edgar Krenz, The Historical Critical Method, J. Maxwell Miller, The Old Testament and the Historian, William Beardsley, Literary Criticism of the New Testament, Edgar Knight, What is Form Criticism, Norm Perrin, oh, give me a break, What is Redaction Criticism, Perrin, William Do Do Doty, <coughs> Letters and Structural Exegesis, the discipline of historiography was developing different methodologies. One of these was historical criticism, which, among other things, attempts to ascertain the genuineness or spuriousness of certain documents. The method was used at the time of Laurentius Valla, who in 1440 demonstrated the correctness of Nicolacuza's convention that the don donation of Con Constantine was not authentic. The document purported to be from Constantine the Great to Pope Sylvester I. It had been used by the Roman Catholic Church to support its claims of temporal lordship over central Italy. But the critical study by Volia, Reginald Peacock independently in 1450, and many others thereafter established the spuriousness of the account. Uh, some more on the footnote. General introductions to the Old Testament from the Old Testament perspective are Gleason Archer, Roland K. Harrison, a conservative reaction to the documentary analysis of the Pentateuch is found in Oswald Alice. The weakness of Pentateuchal criticism are discussed from a secular viewpoint in Walter Kaufman's work, An Overview of the Historicity of the Old Testament and the Use of Critical Methods is provided by Gordon Wenham. For discussion of the sources of Old Testament books, see Cyrus Gordon. For conservative treatments of the New Testament, criticism, George Ladd, Everett Harrison, discussions of the historicity of the New Testament found in two chapters, edited by Colin Brown, F.F. F. Bruce. 
if this method could be used successfully to ascertain the genuineness or spuriousness of the donation of Constantine, it seemed reasonable to assume that it could be applied to the books of the Bible. Did Moses actually write the five books traditionally credited to him? Did events actually occur as described here? Historical criticism was applied to the Pentateuch in the middle of the 19th century. The documentary hypothesis was quite fully developed. It included the following tenets. The Pentateuch is a compilation of several documents, JEDP. Proofs of multiple sources include various use of divine names, presence of doublets, and secondary variations in vocabulary and style. Two, the Pentateuch was composed well after the time of Moses. Three, the historical accounts are in many cases inaccurate. Some portions are in fact fictional, fictional legendary. <clears throat> According to some forms of the theory, later passages of the Pentateuch can be distinguished from earlier parts on the basis of the evolutionary development of religion. If this false hypothesis were in any sense true, the Bible could not simply be taken at face value and indiscriminately quoted from as being dependable. It would rather be necessary to sift through the Bible to determine what is genuine and what is not. From these developments, critical study has become a highly developed procedure involving the use of computers. It is possible to distinguish several types of criticism. Textual criticism, which in the past was sometimes referred to as lower criticism, is the attempt to determine the original text to the biblical books. This is done by comparing various extant manuscripts. Conservatives have often taken the lead in this endeavor. Two, literary source criticism is the effort to determine the various literary sources upon which the books are based or from which they derive. Form criticism is the endeavor to get behind the written sources of the Bible to the period of oral tradition, and to isolate the oral forms from the written sources insofar as this attempts to trace the history of the tradition, it is known as tradition criticism. Redaction criticism is a study of the activity of the biblical authors in shaping, modifying, and even creating materials for the final product that they wrote. Historical criticism, in the sense, employs all of the above, and in addition, draws upon the data of archaeology and secular historical sources. <clears throat> it has as its aim the determination of scholarship and dating issues. <clears throat> Comparative religious religions criticism assumes that all religions follow certain patterns of development. It explains the history of Judeo-Christian faith in terms of these patterns. A common assumption in this endeavor is that religions drop develop from poly to monotheism. Seven, structural criticism attempts to investigate the relationship between the surface structure of the writing and the deeper implicit structures that belong to literature as such. The view of faith and reason espoused in this text will not permit the question of the relationship between the Bible and historical reality to be ignored or settled by presumption. We then must make use of some critical methods, yet there have sometimes been quite violent disagreements over the use of these methods. Those who unqualifiedly accept and employ them may consider those who do not to be naive. The latter, however, see the critics as destructive and in some cases as not believing the Bible. The stance adopted on this matter and the assumptions that go into one's methodology 
have a far-reaching effect upon theological conclusions. It will therefore be necessary to look closely and critically at the biblical criticism itself. The number and complexity of critical methodologies prevent more than a selective examination of some of the issues. We've chosen to limit ourselves to the New Testament and particularly the Gospels and two types of criticism, form and redaction. Since an adequate examination of all types of criticism of both Testaments would require several volumes. It is hoped that this chapter will at least illustrate the stance of some conservative biblical scholars and theologians in relation to critical methodology. And while it will not be possible within the pages of a treatise of this size to share the process of exegesis of each text cited, this brief chapter may serve to illustrate the type of biblical study which lies behind the citation of these texts, form criticism. Form criticism was in many ways a logical outgrowth of source criticism as biblical scholars try to get behind the written sources to determine the growth in the pre-literary or oral period. While the early concentration was on synoptic gospels, it has been extended to other portions of the New Testament and Old Testament as well. well we've got some action going on here in the live chat. I don't know. Uh, The background. By the year 1900, some critics had reached something of a consensus regarding the Gospels. The earlier traditional view that Matthew was the earliest Gospel had been supplanted by the chronological priority of Mark. Mark was believed to have written first, and Matthew and Luke were thought to have depended on their writing upon Mark and another source referred to as Q from the German word quell. This was believed to have been made up to a large extent of the sayings of Jesus. In addition, Matthew and Luke were each thought to have relied upon an independent source initially referred to as special Matthew and special Luke. These independent sources supposedly contain the material unique to the particular gospel in question. Special Luke, for example, was regarded as the source of the parables of the Good Samaritan, the pair of prodigal son. There was a growing conviction, however, that behind these written documents were oral traditions. Form criticism represented an attempt to get at the oral forms and trace the history of their development. This mob methodology has been called Formigeschichte, or Form History. The underlying assumption was that knowledge gained from studying the patterns of various forms and other literatures could be applied to gospel accounts. <clears throat> Observation of the laws of development, followed by oral forms and other cultures, could help lead to an understanding the development of the forms lying behind the Bible. Axioms of form criticism. We've got a few pages here. The values of form criticism. Criticism of form criticism. Until finally we get the redaction yeshikta. Axioms. Stories and sayings of Jesus were circulated in small independent units. When one looks <coughs> carefully, the chronological and geographical transitions between many of the stories in the Gospels seem to be vague. These vague transitions are believed to be the work of an editor, trying to fit the stories together in some coherent form. They are particularly noticeable and abrupt in Mark, especially his use of the word euthaos immediately. Matthew and Luke have done somewhat more skill editing, thus obscuring the type of loose transitions which are so apparent in Mark. Give me a second here.
it is also to be noted that the Gospels present some of the same incidences in different settings. This bears out the view that the evangelists had stories before them like a heap of unstrung pearls. Mark took this heap of pearls and strung them together in a way which seemed to him to make good sense. Number two, these self-contained units or elements of material found in the Gospels can be classified according to literary forms. The tenet is based upon the observation that the oral traditions and literary works of primitive cultures follow comparatively fixed patterns in acute, curt, and few definite styles. First, there are sayings, which include a variety of subtypes, parables, proverbs, such as are in wisdom literature, Jewish, Greek, and Egyptian, prophetic and apocalyptic utterances, legal prescriptions, including rules, the I words, I came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill. And then there are stories, which include several subtypes, apothem stories, which Martin Debellius called paradigm stories, provide a historical setting for a saying or pronouncement of Jesus. Miracle stories are characteristically made up of a description of the historical situation, including the words Jesus spoke at the time and a brief remark about the effect of the parable. Legends resemble the tales and fragments of tales concerning saints and holy men in Christian and non-Christian traditions. A biographical interest is dominant. An example is the story of the cocks crawling after Peter's denial. Another axiom myths are literary devices used to convey a supernatural or transcendent truth in earthly form. They are not easily distinguishable from legends. They usually present the words or work of a divine being. Three, third axiom, once classified, the various units of gospel material can be stratified. That is to say, they can be ranged in terms of their relative ages this, the historical value of various types of gospel units can be de determined. The earlier the material, the more historically reliable and authentic it is. The assumption is that the process by which the church handed down the gospel materials followed the same rules of development which govern the transmission of other oral materials, including popular tales. If we know the processes and patterns that oral traditions follow, it will be possible to ascertain at what age a certain element is likely to have entered. A comic strip appearing in a college newspaper began with one student telling another, the president is wearing a red tie today. In the next frame, the second student told the third student, the president has red ties. A student told a fourth student, honest Prexy, Prexy, Prexy is, died, is tied with the Reds. Finally, this student exclaimed to an amazed fifth student, the president is an out-and-out -out communist. If Wed had only the second and fourth frames, but not the rest of the story, he could determine which had come first and probably could reconstruct the first and third frames with a reasonable degree of accuracy. And just like this rumor, oral traditions follow definite patterns of development. Several conclusions emerge with respect to the gospel materials. For example, the explanations of parables do not belong with parables. The moralizing conclusions often provided are secondary additions. The parables themselves are likelier to go back to Jesus' own sayings than are explanations and moralizing applications. The miracles can often be stratified as well. Some miracles are typically Jewish, healings and exorcisms. exorcisms. These accounts are presumed to have arisen during the earlier period when the church was almost exclusively under Jewish influence. 
Others are Hellenistic, so-called nature miracles, such as the stilling of the water, cursing of the fig tree, reflect the Hellenistic interest. This is so theoretical and hypothetical and assuming and presuming and assertive and dogmatic methodologically. And obscurantistic. Setting in light sits in the Laban of the early church can be determined. A careful study of the Gospels will reveal to us the problems faced by the early church. For the form of the tradition was affected by these problems. Again, another assumption. Specific words of Jesus were preserved in order to deal with the needs of the church. In some cases, sayings may even have been created and attributed to him for this purpose. What we have, therefore, in the Gospels is not so much what Jesus said and did as what the church preached about him, charisma. What did the church proclaim at what, what it did at this point to meet the present situation? Even today, by examining the manuscripts of sermons, including the way Jesus' teachings are interpreted, we can often detect what situations and problems the pastor of a lo local church was dealing with at a given time in his ministry. Not necessarily. I think of all kinds of sermons that don't reflect that. Sorry, Eric. Is it Eric? No, it's Millard is his first name. The same is true of the early church. Preached what met the need. This is not a mat matter merely of form, however, but of content. According to the form critic, the church did not merely select the message, it created the message in order to serve the needs of its existential sits in Leben. The results of form criticism have varied. Some critics, such as Boltman, are very skeptical about the possibility of knowing what really transpired in the life of ministry of Jesus. Boltman wrote on one occasion, quote, one may admit that for no single word of Jesus is it possible to reproduce positive evidence of its authenticity, close quote. This, however, says Boltman, is not total skepticism, quote, one may point to a whole series of words found in the oldest stratum of tradition, which do give us a consistent representation of the historical method of Jesus. Others reach more positive conclusions regarding the historicity of the gospel accounts. And since the 1950s, there has been a new search for the historical Jesus, which takes into account the insights and conclusions of form of criticism. The difficulty which has emerged, however, is that if one accepts the methodology of form of criticism, he cannot simply utilize the materials of the gospel as if the presence of a saying or account there establishes that is indeed what was said or done. In view of the large number of form of critics, sayings of Jesus may well be authentic, but there is a grave question about the framework of the narrative. All information about the original situation is not simply to be left dangling. A skeleton for these sayings was created. Further, it appears that what has been written about Jesus was not from the standpoint of detached observers but from the position of faith. The authors of the gospel were committed to Christ and thus wrote from the perspective of faith and a desire to influence others to faith in this same Jesus. If the position of most form critics is correct, the gospel should be seen as more like sales or promotional literature put out by a manufacturer and merchandiser and less like the carefully controlled research bulletins issuing from an independent scientific laboratory. The question, of course, will be to what extent these materials actually are reliable.
and accompanying and logically preceding that question, to what extent the method being used to determine their reliability is itself reliable and objective. Value of form criticism. This should be interesting. We need to note the positive contributions of form criticism. Some of these have been ignored at times. Partly this was a reaction to the findings of some early practitioners of form criticism, which were rather extreme denials of the historicity of the Gospels. These early critics were also somewhat extravagant in their estimation of the utility of their method, regarding it as giving conclusive or definitive results. Consequently, a reaction took place on the basis both of the content of the conclusions and the degree of dogmatism with which these results were held. I wouldn't call it a reaction, I'd just call it a serious, severe criticism of these dogmaticians. And dogmaticians they were. <coughs> so, that's hardly a reaction. So Bubble. So we don't. We think he needs to fix that word. Some of the early reactions to form criticism were similarly extreme, regarding it as totally negative and an ephemeral method. He calls that extreme. Some of this reaction was due to the association of form criticism with a particular school of theology. In theory, at least, form criticism can be employed by persons holding various theologies. But because of the visibility given to Rudolf Bultmann's alignment of form critical methodology with the demythologization which he practiced, the two came to be regarded as synonymous, or at least inseparable in many mind, people's minds. We must discuss a number of benefits which have emerged. Forum criticism, number one, has pointed out the vital connection between, on the one hand, the incorporation of Jesus' deeds and words into the gospel accounts, and on the other hand, the faith and life of his disciples. We don't agree with this. Perhaps the clearest statement of this was made by John. These things are written that you may believe. This was not a neutral observer writing to fulfill a scholarly concern for information and desiring to convey that information to others. The Gospel of John was written by a man who was convinced of the value of the one in whom he had come to trust. About this, whom he had seen raised from the dead uh, mill. No. It was more important to obey the words of Jesus. This is really weak. It is also apparent that the gospel writers were not concerned to dwell upon aspects of Jesus which were not significant for faith. For example, we are told nothing about the bodily build of Jesus, although of course we would assume that he was of an ideal weight. We know nothing of the color of his eyes or hair although we may make some surmises on the basis of his nationality. We're told nothing about the quality of his voice, his pitch, whether he spoke slowly or rapidly. We are not informed regarding the gestures which he made when teaching or preaching. The reason for this is that these details have nothing to do with the purposes of the, why the Gospels were written. One's faith is unaffected by whether the message was delivered rapidly or slowly. If the content of the idea is taught, that is important, not how it was believed, how it was delivered. It is obvious that the selection was made out of everything which Jesus said and did. John makes this fact very clear, John 21, 25. The selection that John had made reflected the announced purpose of his writing, that those who hear and read might come to faith. Matters of merely biographical curiosity were omitted. 
This is why it would be difficult to write a feature article about Jesus. Human interest items usually are not found in the books of the Bible. Give me a break. The form, number two, the forum critics have pointed out that the Gospels are products of a group of believers. While this might seem to be a disadvantage to lead to skepticism, the opposite is actually the case. If the Gospels had been written by solitary individuals, there might be some sort of private interpretation that so enters into the when one lives alone and never has the opportunity to share his ideas. But because this is this is poor too. Three form criticism points out that we are able to learn considerable amount about the early church and the situations it was facing from the material the gospel writers chose to include in the material they chose to emphasize. Um, I'm wondering if he's really a New Testament critic, Old Testament PhD, and confined himself to systematics. Number four, form criticism when its presuppositions are not contrary to the perspective and positions of the biblical authors is able to help confirm some of the basic assertions of scripture. Here the matter of presuppositions again are of crucial importance. Let's see what here. <coughs> Here the matter are they important. At one point in the development of the method, form critics believe that when the earlier strata of tradition was identified, what would emerge would be rather non, a non-supernatural Jesus, the type that Adolf von Harnack believed he had found, a Jesus who called people to believe in him, with him, not in him, whose message was primarily about the Father, not about himself. This has proven to be an illusory expectation, however, for what we are judged to be <clears throat> by the earlier strata of tradition, we do not find this kind of Jesus emerging. There has therefore tended to be the confirmation of the supernaturalness of Jesus. Other aspects suggested by the sayings of the stories have shown the criteria of the form critic to be authentic. Let us close here. Glory be to the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen.